Amen. All right, Acts chapter 20. So we're starting a brand new uh, chapter. We spent a few weeks in Acts chapter 19. So uh, interesting story. You can kind of start to see why I didn't pass out a map for Acts um, for the third missionary journey because Paul and his crew are just kind of all over the place um, on this third missionary journey um, as they're going, you know, from Greece to Macedonia and back to Greece. Um, it's quite a, quite a trip that they're on. Um, and just in one verse, you know, they'll go from, you know, across the sea kind of thing. So we'll take a look at that. Um, if you do have your map from the second missionary journey, I will point out um, where one of these cities is that we're going to talk about this evening. But look down at verse number one and let's get into the, the chapter tonight. We're only going to get into a few verses here. We'll look at this first story really that happens. Verse number one, the Bible says, and after the uproar was seized. So, of course, this is the uproar of, you know, the... Um, uh, the coppersmiths or the silversmiths and the shrine of, of Diana and all that mess that we talked about in Acts chapter 19 last week. And that was calmed down. So Paul called on to him the disciples and embraced them and departed to go into Macedonia. So, of course, um, he's in Asia right now. He was in Ephesus, which is in the lower part of Asia, which is modern day Turkey. Macedonia is across the sea. Um, northern Greece, I guess, is what you would look at, is what Macedonia is um, today. So they go across the sea again into Macedonia, verse 2. And when they had gone over those parts and given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. So he went over to Macedonia, then he went down into um, Greece. Athens is kind of on the so south uh, east tip of uh, Greece. And there abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him, so the Jews are still chasing him all over the place here as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. So he went back up north, and there accompanied him into Asia. So he went up through to Macedonia, and he was going to come back across the sea again to Asia, okay, modern-day Turkey. And then it just lists a, a group of his companions here. Um, into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, Gaius of Derb, and Timotheus of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. So we've got some people from, you know, Thessalonica is just below Macedonia over there on the Greece um, side. So he's, he's picking up all this, this group of people that are kind of going around um, with him. It's turning into kind of a large group. And they're going, they're not, look at verse 5. It says, these going before tarried for us at Troas. So they went across. Troas is over on the Asia side. It's a coastal city of Asia on the uh, north now, yeah, it's about the northwestern coast of um, what we would call Asia in the Bible or what we would look at as Turkey today. But you see, they're kind of, they're not even all staying together. They're kind of just all traveling around. Um, and then they met up again at Troas, which is the story that we're going to look at tonight. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them at Troas, where they were waiting in five days. Now they're all together again. It says, where we abode seven days. Look at verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber when they were gathered together. So they ate, they're eating supper, you know, you figure that's 6 o'clock or so. And then, you know, Paul preaches literally until, you know, midnight. So he's, he's preaching for several hours. There were many lights in the upper chamber. And when they were gathered, you know, where they were gathered together. And there sat a window, a certain, in the window, a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, yeah, six hours or so, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft as he was taken up dead. He fell from the third story. Um, he was sitting in a window up there. And, you know, he died. The Bible says he fell down and he died. Kind of a sad story. Verse number 10 well, Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread and eaten, and taken a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed. So that's talking about, again, Paul in verse number 11. So he goes and he raises um, Eutychus um, from the dead, and then he goes up and he continues, you know, breaking bread and, you know, fellowshipping and preaching um, to um, the people until... The morning until you know all night long you know until the break of day the bible says and look at verse 12 it says and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted that means you know we're not a little comforted meaning they were very they were extremely filled with joy because of the fact that this young man had been 
raised from the dead. So here we see Paul, you know, he, he does a, a, you know, an extraordinary miracle here. You know, not a lot of people besides um, Paul raised people from the dead in the Bible. And we'll look at a couple of them. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. There is only, uh, you know, three of them, really, that we can, we can look at in the Bible. Elijah is one of them in 1 Kings chapter 17. But the point I want to make is we'll look at a couple of these other, um, besides Jesus, of course. Of course, Jesus raised uh, people. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised other people from the dead. And then many people were resurrected when Jesus died on the cross. Many people, um, you know, don't know that either. But look at 1 Kings 17. Let's see if we can kind of come up with, you know, the significance of, you know, this, this extraordinary miracle of actually raising somebody from the dead. Look at 1 Kings chapter 17. And look at verse 17. This is talking about the, Eli the uh, widow that took in Elijah. Look at verse 17. It says, after it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, of course, Elijah had done a miracle um, for her. Um, they, were, um, they were suffering from the famine that Elijah had put on the land to, you know, basically curse King Ahab. And it came to pass after these things, the son of the woman, um, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, what have I, do, what have I to do to thee with thee, O man of God? O thou art, I can't read today. O thou man of God, art thou come to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said to her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned, saying, Her son. And he stretched himself on the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber to the house and delivered him unto his mother. And, and Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And now look at verse 24. We kind of see the purpose of this miracle here. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God. And the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. So we see that that miracle had a purpose to it. You know, it was to give this woman, you know, a demonstration that Elijah truly was the man of God, as, as if the miracle that he did with, you know, the food and the oil, you know, wasn't enough. God gave this extraordinary miracle um, to show that, you know, this is the man of God and this is God's word in his mouth. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we see a similar story um, where uh, the Shunammite woman's son dies. You don't have to turn there. I'll just explain it to you. But basically, the Shunammite woman, she also receives um, a miracle from Elisha, you know, the successor to Elijah. And her son is wounded um, in a field accident. He's wounded in the head and he dies. Um, and the purpose we see there is Gehazi, Elisha's, um, Elisha's servant, goes to the child and tries to revive the child and bring the child back to, to life, but he can't do it until Elisha comes there and Elisha actually is able to raise um, the child from the dead. So basically showing the importance of the faith of the man of God, which I'm going to show you um, how important that is towards the end of the sermon. And then, of course, Peter, in Acts chapter 9, he raised, um, you know, my favorite disciple in the Bible, Dorcas. You know, he raised her from the dead. I really like to have fun with that name. But, you know, he raised Tabitha, also known as Dorcas in the Bible. You know, he raised her from the dead as well. And if you look at Acts chapter 9, verse 42, I can just read it for you. The Bible says, And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord after that happened. So you see that that had a purpose too. It's not like God is just doing all these miracles. You know, so miracles have a purpose, first of all. You know, that's why, you know, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when they all went out and they spoke in all these different languages, you know, it had a purpose to spread the gospel. You know, the raising, you know, Tabitha from the dead, it had a purpose that many people believed the gospel from that great miracle. All right, now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at verse number 12. So yes, this had a purpose um, for um, Paul as well. Look at first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12. So Paul is preaching for hours and hours and hours, and somebody falls asleep, falls out of the window, and dies, and Paul raises them, raises them from the dead. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12, Paul says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among, among you in all patience, in signs 
and wonders and mighty deeds. So this is showing, you know, I mean, one of the signs, this is a sign that Paul is an apostle, that he was able to raise um, this young man um, from the dead after, you know, he, fall, he fell to his death. So it's basically the main purpose is to show that they were from God, these, these people, right? Whether it be the prophets or Paul, to basically give legitimacy, um, you know, in the, in the case of Peter and Paul, to give legitimacy to their message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So what do we take away from the story is the question, right? I'm sure somebody has preached a sermon. I don't, I've never heard a sermon like this, but I'm sure someone has preached a sermon on this story just talking about just not falling asleep in church. <laughs> you know, just, I could just get up here and just preach a whole sermon and just yell and scream and just like, you should never fall asleep in church or, you know, God is going to strike you down, right? But um, I don't really think that that is uh, the point. It's funny, though, because when I first started preaching, about three years ago, there was somebody that, that consistently, this person is not in the church anymore, and it doesn't really matter, but there was somebody that consistently on Sunday nights would fall asleep, like, consistently in church. And the only thing I took away from that was, like, man, I need to get better at this preaching stuff. It was, like, it was, like, really, like, it really kind of hurt my feelings. I'm, like, man, you know, I'm, like, I'm, like, I spent so much time writing this sermon, and it's, like, apparently not very exciting at all, right? So that's why I jump up and down every now and then, all right? But look, I'm going to give you two points tonight, two points on this story, other than the fact that you shouldn't fall asleep in church. All right, Luke? All right, good. Okay, so the first point I want to make is that'll teach you to sit up front, because I look over here and I see you right away, and I'm just like, all right, I'm going to start using Luke as the example all the time now. It used to be um, Brother Matt would sit up here and I'd use him as the example all the time. But the first thing I want to say, I'll give you two points tonight on this story, aside from falling asleep in church. The first thing I want to say is all these people were gathered together and listening to Paul for hours and hours and hours and hours. They had all these people that were just, you know, all together and just, look, if you're listening to somebody for 6, 8, 12 hours, you are pretty dedicated um, to the message that that person is saying to that person um, themselves. You're pretty interested in what's going on. And you had this large group of people that came together in, you know, this unified church to listen to Paul preach. And here's the thing. You know, through all hours of the night. I mean, it sounds familiar, right? But here's the thing. People, so you had this large group of unified people is the first thing, okay? People, and this is what's interesting. People today, people always are searching for people that have things in common with them. You know, and, you know, the Bible says about the people in Acts and all these different churches, it said they had all things in common. Many times, you know, the Bible says that about believers. Even psychologists today will study this phenomenon about how people have this need, you know, to, to find people to identify with. You know, people just have that desire. You know, and many people, many people in their lives, they can't find their people. It's a common thing. I brought this up uh, before. If you look at polls and just studies of like Americans, you know, it's something like 36% of Americans are lonely like a lot, meaning they don't have people. They don't have their people. They don't have any people. 61, this is amazing, but 61% of people under the age of 40 are lonely, are lonely much of their life is what they will say. So look, this is why people are looking for groups to identify with. And many people just never find it. This is why you see people, you know, group up in like, you know, in, in, in silly little groups like, hey, we all bought the same brand of motorcycle, so let's form a group together. Hey, we all bought the same brand of motorcycle, we could all dress up in the same costume, and we could all ride our motorcycles around and, and be a group together, because people are looking to conform with a group of people. They're looking for their people. But these are very shallow things, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what, you, what groups you pick, 4-H to, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, it's very, you know, sports, you know, sports leagues, fantasy, football, whatever. I mean, people are looking for groups of people to identify with. But unfortunately, many people find very shallow things to do that on, which is all these secular groups and clubs that you'll see um, today. But, 
You had all these people in this story gathered together under the banner of the gospel here. You had all these people gathered together under, to, under the banner of the Bible here. Because what was Paul talking about? I can preach the gospel in about 25 minutes, thoroughly. Paul was clearly talking about the greater word of God here, and that's what these people were unified underneath. These people here, and this is the point I want to make, this is the first point I want to make, these people in this story, they had a very deep bond. People that are unified on the Bible are going to just, by the very nature of the Bible, they're going to have a very deep bond. You say, why? Because every truth is in the Bible, that's why. So when you have people that are unified on the Bible, that's why you're not going to see like big debates after church. Um, we sit around in a circle and have big debates on abortion here. It's just never going to happen because we're unified on the Bible. You're never going to see debates on, you know, homosexuality here, you know, because like we're unified on what the Bible says. You're never going to see debates here on like what a man is and what a woman is and all this stupid, you know, crazy stuff going on. You're not going to see that here because our roots are deep here. We, have ev we are unified on every truth of the Bible. That's what unifies us. It's like it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate unity when you think about it. Which is what? It's, it, it's one of the extreme powers of the church is that deep unity. All right. Look, I mean, we know what up is. We know what down is. You know, we're living in opposite world today. We don't have that problem. It can be very difficult, you know, being by yourself when everyone says the wall is red and when you clearly look at it and say that it's white. If you're by yourself, that would be very frustrating. But that's the power of the unity of the church. I'm going to go deeper into that next week. But that's the first thing I want to point out is this is a unified group of people and they're unified on the deep stuff, right? They're unified on the Bible, right? So when people call evil good and good evil, we're unified against all that. We don't have that problem here. Turn to John chapter 9. Here's the second thing I want to look at um, on this story. This, look, th this, is, this is my opinion that this is the main purpose of this story. This is my opinion that I'm going to give you now. Look at John chapter 9. So obviously you see a unified group of people here that's willing to listen to Paul till all, hours, all hours of the night, all hours of the morning. But I want to give you what I believe is the main purpose of this story tonight. Look at John chapter 9. Look at verse number 1. John chapter 9, look at verse number 1. The Bible says this. It says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They walked by a blind man, and all the disciples say, what did his parents do wrong that, you know, he was born blind? All right? Look at verse number three. Jesus sets them straight. He says, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Look, that's amazing right there. Jesus went and he healed this, this young man, and he made this blind man see. And what Jesus told the disciples there was the reason that he was born blind was so I could heal him. The reason that he was born blind was for this moment right here that the works of God could be made manifest or known through me, through him, through his healing. Look, this is sleepyhead right here. This is sleepyhead that fell out the window. Why did he fall out of the window? So the works of God could be made manifest to everyone in that church. You say... How do you know that? Well, Matthew 18, verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So here's what I know. Here's what I know. Where you had these people gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, listening to Paul preach the Bible for hours and hours and hours, here's what I know. God was there. God was amongst them. How do I know? Because he tells us that he will be amongst people in those situations. And guess what? God wanted to join in. So he wrought a great miracle. He did a great miracle. Why? To add to their joy. That's what the Bible tells us. It says they weren't a little comforted. It's a different way of saying it, but it meant they were very joyful about what had happened. 
is what it meant. So what's the application here? I mean, have you figured it out yet? The application is this. God will wrought miracles amongst us. That is the application of this story. Look, this is exciting, this story. This is exciting news, that where two or three are gathered together in my name, God will wrought miracles amongst us. So the first thing is that we should appreciate things that are done for us by God in the midst of us. Because look, he's in the midst of us. The Bible tells us that he is. We should appreciate, I say this all the time and I'm going to continue to say it until I'm dead. We should appreciate answered prayers. When we go through the prayer list and we pray as a church, you should put things on the prayer list, by the way. Why not use this powerful tool that we have? God says in James chapter 4, in verse number 2 through 3, he says, you have not because you ask not. He's like, you don't have stuff because you don't ask for it. Dummy. He didn't say dummy. I added that part. But the point is, he's like, you don't, ask, <coughs> you don't ask for things. And then he says after that, he's like, and if you don't get the things that you ask for, it's because you ask for the wrong things. But basically, we need to use that tool. And then we should appreciate those answered prayers. But what we do, but what we do is we pray for things. Look, I do it too. We pray for things. And then we get those prayers answered and then we just like we just go whew. and and we for, you know we forget that we, we had an answered prayer there so look keep track of your prayers and just keep track of the prayers that are being answered and make sure that you're thankful for those things but look don't be afraid to ask things because God is in the midst of us and he will wrought great miracles amongst us just like he did for these people at Troas so that's the first point the second point is this the second point is this, the stronger our faith is, and I'll prove this to you from the Bible, the stronger our faith is, the greater works God will do. You say, what? Turn to James chapter 2. This is the lesson from Elisha and Gehazi. Gehazi went and he couldn't, he, you know, we know he was a worldly man. We know that he had, oh, his head wasn't in the ministry. We know that he was you know, about the mammon and about the things of this world. Look, and he couldn't raise that boy from the dead, but Elisha could. You say, why? Was it there's God decided? No, it was because of the faith that was there. It was because of the lack of faith that Gehazi had. Turn to James chapter 2. I'm going to explain to you James chapter 2, which is maybe, the, maybe one of the most misunderstood and misused passages in the Bible. I'm going to explain that in detail for you in just the next few minutes. But James chapter 2 is talking about the measure of faith. It is talking about the measure of your faith. You say, what are you talking about? Um, you know, uh, am I not saved, you know, by faith? You know, yeah, I'm, I mean, for by grace are you saved through faith. Yes, you are saved through faith, but not everybody's faith is equal. I guarantee you that somebody has greater faith than you and somebody has less faith than you. There's a, there's a spectrum of faith. If you're saved tonight, that means you have enough faith to be saved. That means that you have enough trust that you just trusted on Jesus. And that doesn't mean that, you know, all throughout your life, you're just going to have, you know, faith in everything that God is able to do. You know, everybody has doubts. Everybody has, you know, times in their life when they doubt things, where their faith goes down and up. James chapter 2 is talking about the measure of our faith and the difference that it makes. Not all faith is equal. Turn to James chapter 2 if you're not there. Look at verse number 14. So I'm going to explain to you James chapter 2 and show you what it is saying and what it's not saying. Look at verse 14. It says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? James chapter 2, of course, is used by the, the works-based salvation people to, to, to prove that you, know, you have to have works with your faith to be saved. That is not what it's saying at all. What did the first four words say of James chapter 2, verse 14? It says, what, is it, what does it profit? It says, it's not profitable. It's not profitable to have no works with your faith. Look at verse 15. Now he gives us an example, just so we understand. It says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and what do you say unto them? Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding... You give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? 
He gives us an example of what he means by what does it profit. He's saying, what does it profit your brother? What does it profit your brother if you say, hey, I hope, I hope you're warm. You got a brother who's cold and he's hungry. And you go up to him and say, hey, I, I hope you get warm and I hope you get food. See you next Sunday. The Bible says that's, that what you said there is not profiting them because you didn't do anything for them. It says, what does it profit? Look at verse 17. Even so, meaning comparison. It's using a comparison here. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Meaning what? It's saying, even so, it's saying, just like this, your faith is not valuable to other people, is what it's saying. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You see that? He's showing how we should be. He's saying, you know, thou hast faith and I have works. He's like, show me thy faith without thy works. He's like, but, but this, you know, James is saying, I'll show you my faith through my works. Because guess what? You know how I show you my faith? Through my works. Unless you suddenly became God and can see my heart, the only way that we show our faith to each other is through our works. It says, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, as the devils also believe and tremble. So look, up to this point, verse 14, verse 19, very simple, very easy doctrine there. It's just talking about the works that go with your faith, they are what profit other people. That's why I will talk to people after, you know, soul winning and after getting somebody saved. But like, look, you're not saved through your works. But now, you know, God wants you to live the Christian life. God wants you to get into church. God wants you to learn the Bible. God wants you to, you know, obey him, do all these things. Why? So you'll be profitable to your children. So you'll be profitable to your wife. You'll be profitable to your friends and your family all around you. Because who wants to be just this person who has just no value to anyone else? And you can see that as a, as a father. I could be saved and I could just go and just live a life that had nothing to do with the Bible. And it doesn't make me any less saved, but my kids aren't going to get saved. My, my family's not going to hear the gospel through me. And if I live this hypocritical life and I try to open up the Bible to my family, they're going to laugh in my face. That's how it will work. He's talking about being profitable. And if you want to be profitable in your Christian life, you must have the works. Amen. He's not talking about going to heaven. You're saved. That's it. Amen. Look, you have to remember our first Bible reading rule. If you read a verse in the Bible and it contradicts other simple verses in the Bible, you're interpreting it wrong. Because look, if this is talking about, you know, you're, you know, they'll say, you know, your faith is dead being alone. See, you lost your salvation. That's not what it says. It's talking about your faith not profiting anybody. So that's the easy part. We're just talking about profit. Profit to your brothers and sisters and people that are unsaved especially. Now let's get into verse 20, because now this gets a little complicated. And this is really what people use to try to twist the Bible and show that God, or that, that you know, salvation is through works, or partly through works, which is not true at all. Look at verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? How many times have you had somebody quote that to you? Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Okay, I get it. We're talking about two kinds of faith here. That's the first one. Faith without works is dead. So we're talking about dead faith. That's the first kind of faith that we're talking about. Look at verse 21. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? First of all, that's a question. Right? That's a question. It says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So that's the second kind of faith. We have two kinds of faith that we're talking about in this passage. The first one is dead faith. And the second one, if the faith rots with all the works, is perfect faith. So you have dead faith and you have perfect faith. These are the two types of faith. James chapter 2 is talking about a spectrum of faith here. It is talking about the measure of faith. Do you want to be closer to the dead faith part or do you want to be closer to the perfect faith Part. Turn to Romans chapter 4. But it did say like, hey, Abraham, our father, justified by works, wasn't he? And then in verse 23, it says, and the scripture was fulfilled with Seth. Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. And he was called the friends of God. You see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith only. That sounds like works go with faith. 
to be justified. I, look, I read the Bible many times, and I'm just like, man, why did God have to put verse 24 in there? That sounds confusing. But I'm going to explain it to you. All right? In verse 24, it says, you see that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Talking about when Abraham was willing to go up and sacrifice Isaac. God told him to do it. And he went and he did it. All right, now go to Romans chapter 4. You have to see this in Romans chapter 4 in order to make sense out of this. Because look, Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. So if Abraham was justified by works, we've got a problem with the Bible. So what is the deal? And look, you know how I, if the Bible is 1% wrong, we've got a major problem. You know, we had a power plant that was, that was wired, that was wired wrong. There's thousands of connections in this power plant. And everybody started arguing about what percentage of the wires were wired wrong. And they said, oh, it's not that bad. It's only 4% of the wires. And I was like, which 4%? And they said, we don't know. I said, it doesn't matter. We've got to check them all. So quit arguing about how many, what percent is, is miswired. If the Bible is 1% wrong, and I don't know which 1% it is, I can't trust any of it. It's not 1% wrong, though. Go to Romans chapter 4. So it says, in verse 23, it says, or in verse 24 of James 2, it says, you see then how man, uh, that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. What does that mean? Look at Romans 4 and verse number 1. Talking about Abraham. Romans 4 and verse number 1. Now we're kind of getting into some 300 level doctrine here, folks. But pay attention to this. It says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? as pertaining to the flesh, meaning in this body. Look at verse 2. It says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. You see that? You see what that said? You know what that's saying? Is it saying is, what did Abraham find in the flesh? What did it mean by what he did with his body? You know what that means? It's talking about his works. It says, what did Abraham's works buy him? And then it says, if he were justified by those works, it said he could glory. And that's what Ephesians chapter 2, that matches perfectly Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, it's not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. If I was getting myself to heaven, I could brag about that. I could stand in front of Jesus, and if I had to do certain works to get to heaven, I could stand in front of Jesus on that day and say, I should get to heaven because I did these things that you said I should do. And then that would, I would be boasting about doing those things right. But what says the scripture, verse 3, Romans 4? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now go back to James chapter 2 and look back at verse number 23. So it says, Abraham, if he were, ab if he were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. You know what that means? He is not justified by works before God. No one will be justified by works before God. So what does it mean by he was justified by works? The answer is in verse number 23 of James chapter 2. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. He was saved because of the same reason you were saved, because he trusted God. Because he trusted the Lord and the Lord's promise of a Messiah. But then look at this last part of the verse. It says, and he was called the friend of God. By who? By God? No, he was called the friend of God by men. How did men know that Abraham had faith? Because he took his son up to the mountain and was going to sacrifice his only son. Because God told him to. He went and he was willing to do whatever God told him to. And that's why people said, that's a friend of God right there. Because that's how men saw his faith. So he was justified before God by his faith, by his belief. He was justified before men by his works. You know how you are justified to me? You know how I see your faith? Through your works. So when I look at somebody that's just working for the Lord, and just, just constantly just working for the Lord, I'm like, that person's got a lot of faith right there. It's like, that's all I see. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 16, you know, they were bringing Jesse's sons. They were bringing Jesse's sons before Samuel. And Samuel saw the first son, he saw Eliab, and he's like, 
That's the king right there. He, like, he looked like a king. He was tall. He was strong. He's like, that. no. But God said, no, no, no. The Lord looketh on the heart. You see, we don't looketh on the heart. I can only see your heart by what you do, by what comes out of your mouth, by your action, by your works. And guess what? Same works the other way around. The only way you can see my faith is through what I do. If I stood up here and I preach, you know, three times a week, and then, well, next week I only came once, and the next week I came twice, and the next week I came once, and you never knew if I was going to come to church or not, and, you know, I never really went soul winning, but I stood up here and I was like, you should go soul winning. You should go preach the gospel to people. You would look at me and you'd be like, I don't, his, it's a problem that the pastor doesn't have very good faith. You know, he's towards the dead faith end of the spectrum. That is what James chapter 2 is talking about. It's like the men knew their faith. Look at verse 25 of James chapter 2. He gives us another example so we can't misunderstand this. He says, likewise, he's like, here's another example. So look, this is a little bit of deep doctrine here, but he gives enough examples to where it's very clear. He says, likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she hath received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Who was she justified by works to when she hid the spies? Who was she justified by works to when she sent them out another way and she told the army that they went that way? She was justified by her works to those men, to the nation of Israel. And that's what saved her family. You say, that's how they knew they could, that they could trust her. That's how that they knew that she believed God through the works that she did for them. And look, and it saved her family because of it, because of her works. That's what they saw. Look at James 2.26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Right? So look, there's two concepts here. It is, it is comparing dead, work, dead faith with perfect faith. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Can you have completely perfect faith? No. What people do is they try to like, Take both ends of these spectrums, like, yeah, dead faith. Well, there is no such thing as dead faith, because, like, that would mean you had zero works. That's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is your faith should have works and move towards that perfect faith. Nobody has perfect faith. Nobody, otherwise, you would be a perfect person. You would have perfect works. You would never make mistakes. You would be without sin. The only person that had perfect faith was Jesus. All right? But it's, just think of it as a spectrum. Dead faith, perfect faith. And everybody falls somewhere in the, in the middle there. Or in, you know, in between those spectrum. The salvation thing doesn't even make any sense to apply it to salvation because no one will have completely dead faith. That would mean zero works. Maybe I'm too mathematical. Just like no one will have completely perfect faith. And look, here's the thing. This is always the problem with works. This is always the problem with works-based salvation. You're like... How many works do I need to have? Okay, it's by works. Okay, it's faith plus works. If I completely misread James chapter 2, how many, wouldn't you want to know how many works you had to do? Because the Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, that ye may know. The Bible says that ye may know that you're saved. That ye may know that you have eternal life. You could never know. It would be impossible to know if this interpretation of James chapter 2 was true. And it would contradict everything else in the Bible, the simple gospel. All right, so the point is this. James chapter 2 has two takeaways. The first one is this. Our faith is worthless to others if it doesn't have works. That's the first one. That's the easy one. And the second one is men see our faith. We are justified to other men through our works. This is why we ask questions to people at the door. Because we're trying to see what they believe. We're trying to use a methodology to get what's in people's hearts. And this is why we want to be thorough gospel preachers. We want to preach the whole gospel to people. Because even after we pray with someone and they accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't really know for sure, only the Lord knows, that they're saved. We just want to make sure that we're clear, we're doing our part. Because we'll never be able to see the heart. Only God sees the heart. Now, how does that apply to this story? Turn to Matthew chapter 17. So we should have works that rot with our faith, and there's a spectrum to our works. 
There's a spectrum, I'm sorry, to our faith. All right, there is a spectrum to our faith. Look at Matthew chapter 17. Look at Matthew chapter 17. This church in Acts chapter 20, you could see their great faith. You could see their great faith and their interest and their devotion to Paul and their devotion to the word of God. But look at Matthew chapter 17 in verse number 20. He say, what does the spectrum of faith have to do with anything? Look at verse 20 of Matthew chapter 17. The Bible says this, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, ye have faith as a, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to your yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. He's not talking about their unbelief in him, their, their saving you know, faith. He's talking about their unbelief in his ability to heal, his ability to cast out demons. That's why every single time Jesus, you know, say or healed somebody, what did he say most of the time? He said, your faith has made thee whole. It's because they had faith in the ability of him to do it. Faith, and in that case, it was faith that he was God and he was the Messiah and it was all together. But he's like, your faith has made you whole. So look, there's a spectrum of faith. And God is saying here in Matthew 17, 20, he's like, if you have great faith, he's like, I'll do anything for you. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's like, if you have great faith, he's like, I will literally move mountains for you, is what God is saying. We shouldn't leave this type of stuff on the table, is what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight. Look, he's saying God will work with great faith, look, with faith, with a, especially two or three people gathered together with great faith towards that perfect end of the spectrum. God is saying, I will do great works there. Look, this is an exciting message. This is good news. And look, the greater our faith, the greater the works that God will do. That's what he's saying. That's what he's telling us. And that's what we see demonstrated in Acts chapter 20. The greater your faith, the greater God will move in your family. The greater your faith, the greater God will move in your life. And let me tell you something. God, will, God is alive today. God will move things for you. You say, well, he's never done that. Well, you need, to, you need to get your faith on track. You need to get your faith on track. And look, God will move mountains out of the way for you. I was somebody that didn't really, before I was saved especially, I was like, yeah, God doesn't really do stuff on this earth. I believed in God, and I believed in the Bible. But I was like, God doesn't really, you know, come and intervene. No, God does. He will move things out of the way for you. You become somebody that's faith-filled, that's profitable, that's moving along in your Christian life, and God will get stuff out of the way for you. That's what you've got to know. That's, what God, that's the demonstration that we're seeing in Acts chapter 20. Don't leave that one on the table. That's valuable right there. God will move mountains for you. And if he doesn't, it's because, it's because of your unbelief. Not your unbelief in Jesus as your Savior. It's just your lack of faith. Look, you know it's true. We all have doubts. Everybody has doubts. I'm not going to stand up to you, stand up here and say, I'm the pastor of this church. I never have a doubt. My faith is perfect. That's ridiculous. We all have doubts. We all have weak spots in our faith. We've got to shore those things up. And guess what? Being part of a church, a faith-filled church, will shore those things up. And that's what you saw here in Acts chapter 20. It's a great promise for us here. Not only do we get to be unified with believers, which in itself is a joyful experience. I don't know what I would do if it wasn't for Wednesday church. I mean, you go out there in the circus for a few days and you just want to get back together with sane people that love the Lord. It's a joyful experience in itself. Look, I hope church is joyful for you. It should be. But guess what? It's even better because God will also join in. That's what we're seeing here with this young man that fell out the window. You say, boy, you really read into that. But that's what, that's what happened. That's what happened. God is active today. That's what you need to understand. You know, don't just, don't just realize that with your prayers. But yes, do realize that with your prayers. But God will actively move in your life. He will, the Holy Spirit, remember you have the Holy Spirit interceding for you. So when you pray to win the lottery, the Holy Spirit is saying, God, he didn't mean that. What he wants is to find a good church, and what he wants is to get his family you know, spiritually on track, and what he wants is these things, and what he wants is to serve you. And God will move things out of the way to help you. 
and to be with you and to just bless you with miracles. I mean, it's, it's such a great thing. It's such a great thing. And we see it, it's promises for all of us. It's good news here on, on Wednesday night. You know, God will move in our lives. And, and the stronger we get as a church body and the more work we do for the Lord, the more God will move here as well. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.